Dr. Oliver Morgan. Welcome to the Science of Psychotherapy podcast. How are you doing today? Thank or this you. evening? <laughs> this, this evening for us. <laughs> That's yeah, it. I'm doing, I'm doing fine. Thank you very much. Wonderful, and, to, wonderful to see you, Oliver. It's Richard here. How are you? Good to see you too. Right. Yeah, it's, um, it's an exciting time with the new book out and um, looking at some... Uh, my, my students, of course, are being forced to read it, <laughs> and uh, so I guess they're I guess they're all happy about that because they, the last couple of years, um, I've used the book in my courses, but kind of as loose leaf copies and given them a chance to edit and do stuff with it. So, so give us a little bit of a background to the motivation, you know, for the book and the sort of the process of of fleshing this book out. Okay. Um, I've, I've thought a lot about how to start today. Mm -hmm. And I guess the one place would be in 1987, I was desperate. Okay. I was, um, I had, I had finished 20 years of a long drinking career. Um, and I was sitting in detox trying to figure out how the hell I got there. Wow. Um, my, I knew that I had lots of genetic risk. My maternal grandfather died of uh, alcoholism. He, he uh, died on Skid Row, actually. And all three of my uncles uh, died of it. Um, and so I'm, I'm sitting in detox saying to myself, is this going to happen to me too? How the hell mm. did I get here? And what's going on? Yeah. Um, I, I bought into the classical disease model of addiction. Mm -hmm. um, that's what they were, when I was in treatment, that's what we talked about. That, that's what was de rigueur at that time. That was the predominant model. Yeah. Um, and I bought into that when I, and then I went back to a doctoral program. I, I got out of the doctoral program to go to treatment and then went back to it and uh, finished my dissertation where I was working on um, recovery. Interestingly enough, in 1987, there was not a lot of research wow. into recovery. There still okay. isn't. Wow. Yeah, that's true. Um, that's so true. Mm. So I finished the dissertation and then came to the University of Scranton because I was the only one who had any experience with addiction. Um, they gave me a set of three courses we had um, that were state approved for training for people. And they said, do, do what you think needs to be done with them. Well, I took a look at the courses and they were not, um, there was nothing in recovery. It was basically, these are drugs. This is what drugs do to you. And that's the end of the story. There was nothing about recovery or which is a different animal. So I started changing the courses. I was adapting them and moving along. And I, I worked in things that were becoming more important in the research. So I worked in motivational interviewing, stages of change, um, relapse prevention, um, and different kinds of what I call invitational interventions rather than the a and E, con you know, the TV channel, the confrontational intervention, which doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I, I did a lot with uh, invitational interventions and I was starting to question um, the disease model. It, right. I understood it. I taught it, but it was, it wasn't fitting my experience either in the classroom or clinically. Yeah. Um, so then, clinic, clinically, you're fleshing out these ideas, right? So clinically, yeah. you're, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And you know, the disease model is a pretty standard one. Um, mm -hmm. But it, I saw a lot of things that didn't quite match up. I saw people, I knew people in my own family who just stopped. They were able to stop and, and move forward and have productive lives. And that wasn't supposed to be able to be done. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I... Then I ran. Then I ran into um, Rob Anda. Rob is a, a a physician and an epidemiologist at uh, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. He came to a conference that I attended, and um, that conference changed changed my way of thinking. Mm 
because he was the, he was one of the two co-investigators for the adverse childhood experiences study. Oh yes, of course, of course. Yeah. And um, basically what he, what he convinced me of was that underneath addictive behavior and more so underneath people's tenacity holding on to it, not wanting to let it go, there were hidden motivators, hidden drivers, mm -hmm. and those drivers were trauma. Yep. yep. And, and that that really captured that idea really captured my way of thinking. Mm. Yep. But the question became if 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 trauma is is that big a motivator underneath a lot of addiction, what are the mechanisms? How do we get from trauma to addiction? How does that how does that work? So I decided over time that I wanted to do a book and explore all that. And that's how I got into interpersonal neurobiology because the, the connections from what trauma does to the brain and, and the wiring of, of who we are, not just our brains, but who we are, that really um, determines some of the ways we try to cope with our past lives, with our past experiences. Mm -hmm. And so it, the neurobiology became a way to understand the transition from trauma into addiction. And even more so, the adverse childhood experiences studies tell us that trauma underlies a lot of mental health and physical health as people get older. Yeah. So that what yeah. physicians are seeing in their offices in adult health really rests on a, a significant part of it rests on, uh, on trauma. Yeah. And, on and, trauma. and yeah. I think that cause, cause we've, we've overplayed and underplayed uh, the, the nature of trauma rather than just looking at it. In, in, if you just look at the fundamental, the trauma is, is a, some kind of embedded or, or remaining um, experience or time that where you were unsafe. Yeah. And this has remained as a memory or has remained as something. And when you think of the number of opportunities and possibilities in which we are unsafe, the vast, the vast majority, of course, that we hope become um, uh, learning experiences or, uh, and post-traumatic growth. Uh, there's all kinds of discussions and terminologies we use. But the opportunity for us to have had an unsafe be in an unsafe state and it has remained as a unresolved um, uh, trigger for some other behavior later on in a deeper level. It's like, duh. You know, <laughs> uh, and yeah. so it was wonderful to see your book bringing it out so clearly. And, and Matt, mm. you're, you're champing at the bit, I know. Sorry, I'm, <laughs> I'm ra raving on you. Because I'm interested with the ACE study and this revelation of, you know, trauma being a driver in your personal journey, because you've had personal experience um, with alcohol, what, what sort of lit up for you? Like what personal revelation did you have? Oh, Matthew. The, um, there's another chapter for the book that isn't in there. <laughs> okay. And I, I really had to decide whether I was going to include it or not. And I decided not to in part because, you know, you always want to leave room for a second book, I guess. <laughs> um, but I, it, it took me a long time to claim my own trauma history. Okay. And to, and to understand what was going on. Mm. Um, you know, so how did I wind up in treatment and in, de in that detox I started talking about? And once I finally understood my own trauma history, it lit up the rest of the research. Mm. Um, when um, my family tells a story that when, um, after I was born, um, I didn't sleep through the night for the first 11 months of my life. Wow. This is, this is the story. Mm -hmm. you know, it's a family story. All right? okay. So it's a bit yep. mythological and it's got other right. things. But, mm -hmm. And I didn't sleep until my parents being totally exhausted, standing over my crib saying, if he, if he doesn't sleep tonight, we have, we're going to have to put him in the basement. Right. And of course, I slept that night right. and every night thereafter. <laughs> um, 
But it, that story really told me a lot about what was going on at home. The mm -hmm. truth is, as I found out um, much later, not long ago, actually, just a couple years ago, the truth is that when my mother found out she was pregnant with me, I was, I'm the caboose. So I, right. everybody else was at least eight years older. Um, she went into a depression and she went into a depression in part because she was planning to leave my father. Hmm. Now this is 1949, you know, people didn't yeah. do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and then once I was born, that depression deepened into a postpartum depression right. so much so that my dad had to call my grandmother, her mother to come take care of the family. Mm-hmm because she couldn't get out of bed. She couldn't. And I started thinking about what, what was that infant like yeah. for those first 11 months? Yeah. And, and I realized that there was, you know, there's a psychoanalytic theory called the dead mother that talks about what happens with infants if they're interacting with a, a caregiver who's very, very depressed. And it, it's like the infant is trying to reach out to work with a dead mother, mm. which of course then plays into attachment issues, you yeah. know, whether it's ambivalent attachment or anxious avoidant or whatever. Mm. So um, that really helped to frame some of my own way of thinking about this. Yeah. Yeah. Because particularly because you bring in, in the title of the book, it, it talks attachment and trauma. And uh, I've, I've always seen them as a, a, an interplay. Um, I mean, the, the, yes. a lot of it, particularly those, uh, and certainly th those attachment styles, and it's a way of looking at things. But you can't talk about uh, difficulties in attachment and insecure attachment without talking about trauma at the same time, because right. that's where, the, that's where the, the insecure attachment comes from. And we just have this habit in, in the work we do uh, through this, the nature of the way we define science and various things of isolating these things and differentiating them as, <laughs> as though they, yes. they don't exist together, but they're really just facets of, of, of the same thing. So, so when you decided, so you actually decided to put it in the title. I mean, you, you, you were, you were yes. very strong in your feelings about this. Um, I can hear in the, in the personal uh, framework of it, but from that theoretical frame, what was, what was your thinking there? Well, you know, the people who experience trauma don't just have a memory of it, but particularly if it's childhood trauma. A lot of that comes, a lot of the childhood memories are in our bodies. They're not, they're not in explicit memory pictures. They're in our bodies. And knowing that there are, that there are people out there who have implicit memories like that, and also that it shapes the kind of brain circuits we have, our needs for caregiving, holding, comfort, and people who don't have that early on, where do they search for it? What's, what's their model for being able to be comforted, to find buffers for the stresses in their lives? And I think that's one of the ways that I think about addiction as chemical comforters. You know, the way to begin to uh, cope with the stresses in one's life. Um, yeah, and getting, I, think it's, yeah. I was going to say, getting out of the it you don't like and into an it that you do like. Uh, and, and certainly those chemical comforters, uh, they do. I mean, even, even, if we don't, um, even if we don't sort of uh, uh, introduce the, the chemicals into you, things like, you know, high levels of exercise to, to try and stimulate increased amounts of endorphins or, or and as we know uh, later on, we do things by, uh, you know, uh, self, self harm by cutting. The, yes. the, the part yes. of this is all about this of can I just up regulate up regulate something better? I mean, my, my work now is I'm, I'm actually, I actually am getting more and more convinced that you can do this uh, with curiosity, but um, anyway, I'm just giving a plug for myself. So we won't go into that. <laughs> so, but, yeah. So but, the key, the key point here is that we are, we're, we're grasping for something to emulate the, what, what normally happens with that, 
the comfort of secure attachment. Right? Something that echoes that that primary experience mm -hmm. of attachment, the which sweet, we which we're hardwired for, right? Which we're hardwired to we're hardwired to expect it. Yes, right? and we have this innate sense of yes. what it should be. As, yeah. as we have an innate sense of when we feel good and when we feel bad, when we're happy, when we're sad, and so on and so forth. Which is why I started the chapter that's in the, in the magazine with the story about Rusty. Mm, because right, he, right, yeah. when he was born, I, I didn't know what to expect. I would, I would, you know, he's my, he was my first born child. I have two others who were adopted. But when I, when I called out his voice, his name, he reached for me. I mean, clearly turned his head and reached for me. And, and that was, that's become my metaphor for the kind of attachment that people expect, anticipate. And when it doesn't happen or when it doesn't happen as well as it could, the person begins to, to expect a different kind of world than the one that, that they should be able to expect. Mm -hmm. You this know, is your, your so as you say, this is your rat pups experiments and yes. all those well, expressions. Richard, you 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 guys know uh, Bruce Alexander, mm. I say, from Canada, mm. the globalization of addiction. Bruce is he and I have corresponded a lot. I've I've really learned a lot from him, mm. and that takes me back to this thing about chemical comforters. <laughs> They're not just chemicals, you know. We know that we know that. Drugs and chemicals are one form that addiction takes, but behavioral compulsions, gaming, gambling, sex addiction is also really important as the World Health Organization has recognized. And then my students would laugh right now because I, they know what the next thing coming is. I have this third group of things that we do, aholias, which are workaholism, uh, ah. Yeah. Addiction to wealth, to, to um, status, to mm -hmm. celebrity, those things can be every bit as captivating as drugs can be. And in some ways, those aholias are our most dangerous ones. Mm -hmm. You know, I say, to, I say to my students, if you're not sure that addiction to wealth is a real addiction and very dangerous, look at the Amazon. Look what we're doing to the planet. And, and that's, it's all about making money and, and finding security. Right. Mm. Yes. The fact that that's a, that's actually, a, uh, can be looked at as a, as a, as a dysfunctional state. I mean, uh, as they look at the Amazon uh, and in a lot of places, just look down the street. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a, that's a big, big, it's a big and important, uh, comment and I and and it's one of the things in the book that on its own uh, is is a really important thing to bring to bring forward and it's a, it's it's not that no I, I know I have seen these sort of things discussed a little bit but you you've brought it into a focus that I haven't seen done before. Uh -huh. Well, it's it, this is this is how my thinking goes with social ecology, that the way we treat each other, the the things that happen to us as we grow up also affect the planet because we we treat each other as commodities oftentimes it's one of the things that's most distressing to me about what's happening in the united states right now we we treat each other as commodities just as we treat the, the planet as a commodity that we can use however we care however we care to without thinking of the ramifications and the consequences mm -hmm. And that is satisfying something within us that is looking for the satisfaction of that attachment need. Is, yeah. is that the full circle? Is that where we're, what we're talking about? Yes, I think I think uh, control is mm -hmm. is part of that issue. We know we talk about addicts being control freaks. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. I once I once had one of my patients say to me, "You know, I had a great day." if everybody did what I expected them to do when I woke up in the morning. <laughs> yes. If everyone and would just cooperate. Yes, if everyone that's would right. just cooperate. That's right. And I think it's, but it's hard for us to think of it that way when, when it's so deeply embedded um, in our biology. You know, there's a, 
there's a wonderful phrase that that I that I use a lot. Biography, when we're talking about neurobiology and that biography becomes biology. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that and that that biology then gives rise to a self, to who we are, to the creation of culture. It's it's an interesting circle because um, social experience gets leaves footprints in our neurobiology that then get expressed in culture and belief systems and poetry and music. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. you've got that reinforcing, you've got that reinforcing feedback loop, right? Yes. Yeah. And, and as we always talk about, we must think in complex systems, not in linear processes. This, this commodity type of, 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 of thinking is just assuming that there's, there's a separateness and that we can separate ourselves from these things, but we can't. We yeah. are, we are embedded in all ways to everything uh, and, you know, we sneeze and, uh, you know, the butterfly flaps its wings and the tornado occurs. And this idea that we can just um, move one commodity over here and one thing will happen over there is unfortunately the error of our education. And, and social ecology is, I think, uh, a very important subject in order to give us that idea of this integrative, dynamic, um, uh, complexity-based framework we live in. We've learned really well how to isolate things so we can study them with our science. Mm. We haven't learned really well how we can integrate them back in so that right. they they really do interpenetrate each other. Mm. Mm. It's, it's sort of like... Yeah. I was just going to say, it's, it's, it's sort of like the, the analogy I, Matt and I were talking about a little while before. Uh, it, it's like someone who takes a carburetor out of a, a car and sees better ways to investigate it and they expand it and they research it and they develop it and they, and they, they uh, make it a much better carburetor. And then instead of putting it back in the car, they put a fence around it and say, you know, pay me 20 bucks and you can look at my carburetor. It's just the <laughs> oddest thing. You know, the, the logic is to put it back in the car so the car runs better. Yes. I don't get it. Which was the reason you did it in the first place. Which was the, the, the original intention, but it gets lost. gets lost somehow. Yeah. Okay. Can I ask what changes have you seen um, when it comes to uh, rehabilitation um, with, with everything that you've been expressing, you know, through this book and, you know, as a, as a professor? Mm-hmm. Um, are, we, are we seeing sort of um, some, some lights, you know, on the horizon when it comes to a change in rehab? I, be, I believe we are. Mm-hmm. The, um, you know, we have, we have research that gives us some, some drugs that we can intervene with. Yeah. Um, so we have naloxone now. We have a number of other things that can really help us. But that's, that's, that's a limited, that's going to be a limited success rate. What we, really, what we really need in rehab is to think more um, synthetically about how to work with people. So approaching addicts and trying to get them into treatment through their families. Right. So um, the Arise program, CRAFT, uh, that Bob Myers has put together, there, there are ways to work with the family so that we can approach people um, – who need to get into treatment, but then treatment has to begin to be very different. You know, there's, there's a, there's a whole area of research now in the United States about the treatment industry, that it's really locked in a, in a unhelpful way of beginning to, of thinking about how to approach people. Right. And what we have to do is be much more open, much more thinking about recovery as a lifestyle rather than getting people to a point where they can graduate from treatment <laughs> and, right. and be okay now. They can go off and live their lives. Recovery is an ongoing thing. And, and really, we need to think about it that way. And in part, what I think that means and what we're starting to see in the United States and other places is that recovery-oriented systems of care have to begin to take over for people who are in, who are in their, in in a recovery lifestyle. What do I mean by that? The, 
we're learning a lot, for example, from physician programs in addiction, law enforcement programs, where people are in treatment longer. They have um, connections. They maintain connections back in the communities they're going to be working in. They have institutions and systems in those communities so that when they leave treatment, they have something to go back to. They have people who work with them as they move forward. Um, we have um, residential uh, services in universities, for example, that are uh, recovery houses. Mm -hmm. uh, we have recovery high schools in different parts of the United States mm -hmm. where, where kids can get together and share their recovery stories and be part of each other's lives. That kind of building connections <laughs> is is really where the recovery movement needs to move. Mm. Uh, and yeah. those things are showing some real success. We know that those are important. Uh, simple connections. You know, we, mm. rather than staying in our offices, waiting for addicts to come to us, when they finish in treatment and they go back in the community, staying in touch with them through email, through phone contacts, following up, and finding out how they're doing, and if they need reintervention, doing that quickly. Um, all those kinds of uh, things. Twitter, using Twitter and Facebook as a way to stay in touch with people who are in recovery, sending them suggestions on things they can do, finding out how they're doing, all that stuff. That systemic kind of building connections into people's lives is really important. I think the other thing that, that has become really important, Matthew, is what we're learning from places like Portugal and uh, Switzerland and other places, so that rather than spending a ton of money mm -hmm. on law enforcement and other kinds of things mm -hmm. like that to fight addiction, they're actually reinvesting some of that money into helping people rebuild their lives, rebuild their connections. Mm -hmm. back into the societies that they've kind of opted out of. So providing uh, funds so people can start businesses, finding safe housing for people. Um, and we're finding some of those things being tried in specific cities in the United States. I think Seattle is one of them. Um, and we're seeing some real success. Right. Yeah. yeah. This so I think, that, that kind of systemic approach is really yeah. important. Yeah, well, yeah. because I was just going to quickly, because I know you got that, but just want to, because the international stuff, we've just had the podcast before with my friend uh, Sharif Darwish from saw, uh, I saw Egypt. That, yeah. And he's come across, you know, come up with a lot of the similar thinkings that, that, that you've come up with, you know, the motivational interviewing, the integration. But yeah, and you, when you saw that bit, which I thought was the most wonderful use of culture, was that they, they open up a, a uh, food uh, venue that they sell as a food venue in Ramadan so that their breaking of the fast, which of course for them breakfast is at, is at six o'clock at night, uh, yeah. is done with families and together and with various addicts and, uh, and, uh, and that engagement. So, but what's beautiful uh, is, is that when you put your mind to it, um, it seems that uh, good people like yourself and Sharif are realizing and coming up with the same sort of fundamental aspects of human engagement, attachment and trauma that, uh, that you've, you've written in your book. Addiction yeah. and trauma disconnects people. Mm. It fragments their lives. Mm. And finding ways to build social engagement back into people's lives yeah. is really important. I just saw there's a new movie. I don't know if it is coming to Australia or not. There's a new movie in the United States called Recovery Marathon. Okay. It, okay. Um, Look out for that. And this is about a group of a group of people um, doing exercise and training for a mar marathon together. They're, they're all in recovery, and it's about the, their interrelationships among each other. There are other things in the States. Phoenix Multisport is another one where people are doing um, skiing and other kinds of exercise things, but staying together. It's, it's, mm. it's like having a social club built around recovery, but also around exercise. These are very interesting. 
to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Solipsism was wrong, and and uh, may it may it die a, a a lonely death somewhere on its own somewhere. <laughs> That sounds like a dead horse. <laughs> it, it does. It does. Now, I think is you know we've got to this point, Matt. That yeah. uh, we've there's been such a beautiful. I'm kind of liking feeling this is a, a nicely rounded up, and then we've found Ollie that there's this sort of this natural thirty minute ish type of frame that works really well for yeah, people. Matt, but it, Matt suggested that. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so is there, if we sort of wrap up now, is there something, there was a beautiful set of, of, of wrapping up points in the last few minutes of your, of your discussion there. Is there something else that uh, you'd like to um, put in just as our, our, our perfect takeaway for the day or, uh, or imperfect if you want? <laughs> uh, I, guess, I guess the other thing that I, would, that I would talk about is that when I think about trauma, the adverse childhood experiences studies really expanded my way of thinking about trauma. You know, for mm -hmm. a long time, even up until the Vietnam War, we thought about trauma as big T trauma, big events that happen in people's lives. But trauma happens in all kinds of other ways. And mm -hmm. one of the things that I've found really interesting is that the World Health Organization has adopted the ACE studies and as they're looking overseas at different things, they're also expanding the way we think about trauma. So they're, they're thinking of things like family separations, child conscription, um, genital mutilations. Yeah, um, serious things. Yeah. Serious things. Huh? And, and I was mentioning to Matt, Richard, before you came here, it's one of the things that most distresses me about what's happening in the United States is the way our, we are separating families at the southern border mm -hmm. and putting children in cages. And we are creating, if, if our theory is correct, that trauma affects people's neurobiology and their health for generations, we are setting up a whole problem for ourselves in the future. Yeah, and, it, and it's difficult. Yeah, I mean, there's political considerations. There's games. There's money. There's this. There's borders. There's stuff. But fundamentally, human beings need need certain things, and they don't need certain other things. And we would like, and I know you, because your book puts it out so well. If we just understand what what enables a human being to find the what Stephen Colbert says so beautifully, the most of ourselves. Yes. Uh, and, uh, and unfortunately, uh, there's lots of people who have other agendas where uh, that, that human element is, is less than important. But social ecology is the, the, the idea and the framework of thinking that, that just says, um, yeah, 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 all that stuff. But frankly, this is, what's, this is what's important. That's why the last chapter talks about creating a, a community. Uh, mm -hmm. of compassion where no one is left behind yeah, no yeah. one is outside the circle that's that's in the end what's going to help us defeat addiction and it, and help us defeat trauma as well wonderful that is a wonderful note to to finish up on beautiful dr oliver morgan thank you so much for connecting with us and being on the show and being in our magazine and for your wonderful book and uh, uh we will point everyone um, to these resources in the show notes, but just thank you once again for, for connecting with us. It's been wonderful. Matthew, Richard, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Ollie. Okay.